to start recording here. Um, today marks a uh, important uh, day. Um, it's a day of significance in terms of uh, a uh, impending transition to new material. Today is our last day focusing on compartmental or system dynamic stock and flow models. That journey has taken us through more qualitative sides of the system dynamics tradition, as well as quantitative. Those are joined by a common perspective, uh, a common uh, focus on uh, feedbacks and accumulations as key elements driving system behavior, a diagram-centric focus, whereby we not only characterize systems diagrammatically in a model-based way, to use terms from as they're applied often at software engineering, but we also use diagrams to reason about the behavior we see. When a value of a what's recognized as a stock is rising, we reason about inflows and outflows. It tells us that the net in, there's a net inflow that the sum of the inflows minus the sum of the outflows are is greater than zero. There's more coming in than there is leaving. When we see an exponential rise in the value of a stock, we often connect it to the identification of a feedback within our diagram. When we think about the delays in shifting the value of a stock, perhaps it's the number of people in a hospital or the number of people sick with COVID, that delay is caused by inertia often because it's a stock. It takes a while to drain it down. Whereas flows can often change much more quickly. Uh, they could be the number of new people coming in per day to the emergency or to the you know to, to the emergency room with COVID may fluctuate and generally will fluctuate much more quickly than the number of people in the ICU. Um, the number of people coming into the ICU on a given day will fluctuate more quickly than the number of people in the ICU, reflecting, for example, that people might remain in the ICU, the, in, the uh, intensive care unit, for three weeks, um, for example, or four weeks um, before discharge. So when we're interpreting system behavior, behavior of a system empirically, data from the world, we often think back to diagrams in system dynamics. It's this diagram-centric reasoning that plays a central role in system dynamics. And that's true for causal loop diagrams. It's true for stock and flows, and it's true for this kind of intermediate form that I haven't much emphasized called system structure diagrams, which are basically system, they're kind of like, hybrids of the two where we're very explicit about indicating polarities and feedback loops and and so on as we are in causal loop diagrams but where we distinguish the stocks but we don't associate formulas with those stocks or formulas with the auxiliary or dynamic variables in the model so system dynamics is this very diagram centric perspective, but it's most foundationally perspective for, for learning about reasoning about uh, under, to understand and to help manage complex systems by by looking at feedbacks and accumulations. And while our coverage of system dynamics has gone through a broad arc that's included qualitative and quantitative components, um, that much has unity, is in common. And today we're going to, to talk about some aspects of system behavior with a different lens 
and we'll talk about equilibria, these points of stasis, these points of balance for our systems, these emergent features. And we'll see how they show up in this new type of lens we'll be introducing. The lens of what are variously called state space portraits or phase space portraits. Both of those are common terminology for a for a certain type of depiction. A depiction which differs from most of the ways we've been illustrating system behavior, which has been an axis of time and various variables. And instead, it will be a state-focused perspective where we have each axis is states. Or when we're dealing with empirical data, and we don't have a particular model that we want to privilege. Those could be measured variables. And note it's evolution there. There won't be an axis for time. There'll be a behavior will be arced out on this diagram showing the the states or quantities of the system. And these are called, again, state space plots or phase plots. Now we'll be seeking to, to finish this up for, for system dynamics, for stock and flow models, uh, in particular compartmental models today. But I don't want you to lose track of the fact that these insights, these perspectives, this new lens of state space portraits, this way of thinking about equilibria, thinking about inflows and outflows, and they're the ways in which they dictate the broad behaviors of a of a stock over time, whether it's rising or falling, and how quickly. The ways in which uh, exponentially growing behavior, unstable behavior so that snowballs, whispers to us about, sometimes positively yells about the presence of a positive feedback, stability in the system. And, con and result of perturbation, result of disturbance of a system, the ability of the system to bounce back and restore its balance to what it was before the disturbance, that speaks to us of a negative feedback loop, a balancing loop. All those will carry over to the other two traditions to which we'll be coming, agent-based modeling, and discrete event simulation. Bear these things in mind. They are not purely beholden to, not limited to system dynamics. And if you can keep that perspective, the remainder portions of the course will be that much richer. But time is short, and we need to jump in if we're to cover this broad set of material quickly. I'm increasingly trying to post some slides prior to um, prior to class. And I, I have to apologize for um, not uh, living up to that part of my expectation today. Uh, but I do want to uh, switch over to some slides, which I will uh, seek to share um, shortly after class and, and, and ideally during office hours. So I, I want to talk a little bit about state space. I'm, I'm going to talk about and hint some words on intrinsic dimensionality um, that will provide a perspective that's really important for data science of state space reconstruction that we may return to towards the end of the class. But for those interested in data science, for those interested in taking data from the world without presupposing a model structure, without privileging a certain model understanding, and, and want to hear what it's telling us about these dynamical systems that give rise to it. These will be important concepts. And I want to, I know there are some of you in, in class very interested in that perspective. And I, I want to hint as to that with an eye towards fuller discussion, more fulsome discussion, hopefully later in the semester or in office hours. So, you know, the perspective that we've been taking in this class regardless of tradition of system science, 
is one where we have this external world that's evolving. It's a dynamical system. It's evolution. How it evolves depends on its current state, its current situation. The number of people being discharged from an ICU every day, it's very different if that ICU is full, chock-a-block full of people, or is thinly populated. The number of people getting COVID in within Saskatchewan depends very much on an aspect of state. The number of people who are infective with COVID and the number that are susceptible at varying levels to it. How systems evolve, dynamical systems evolve over the next little bit depends on their state. That's true of all the traditions for modeling. We capture that fundamental truth. And we capture it in different languages, different ways with metalinguistic abstraction. We use different languages for different circumstances. But all of these share this perspective that we're dealing with a situation in the world that is evolving. It's typically a nonlinear system and nonlinear dynamical system. And we have these measurements from the world which are delayed, often non discontinuous, incomplete noisy measurement error sort of vagaries of, 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 of when they get recorded or what have you and sometimes they're erroneously attributed but but the, their, their data come from the world and, and those data often encapsulate patterns um in data science and particularly machine learning component of data science seeks to identify discover, and take advantage of those patterns for classification or for prediction, sometimes prediction in the future, sometimes to fill in absent information. And we're, we're taking a look at these patterns, but from the perspective of, of system science, ladies and gentlemen, these patterns are but different faces of, different facets of, different whispers from an underlying dynamic coupled nonlinear dynamical system that's evolving. These are the emergent features of it. And, and that has great significance because they are contingent upon. They are the, the, the nature of the pattern, the, the particular structure of them, the particular features of them will, will change as we change this underlying system or our measurement of it. In, they changed to, to use the words of 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 uh, in the common in the statistics area based on changes in the data generating process. They're not these patterns are not coming directly like manna from heaven. They're not they're not springing like Athena from Zeus's head in a full form. But they are instead. Uh, whispers of this underlying system in the data generating process, the way in which we collect data about it. And, and there will be changed as we change the system, as we intervene on in it, as new vaccines are introduced or 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 uh, people's behavior changes, wearing masks more, wearing masks, masks less, as immunity wanes in the population or is built up, et cetera. Patterns evolve. So... There's a very rich perspective that I, I don't have much time in this class to talk about, but where I teach about in some other classes, if people are interested, which unites the system science perspective with this data science perspective and recognizes um, the ways in which these patterns whisper to us about this underlying system and are contingent upon it. And one of the key elements of that perspective, the systems data science perspective, is it's the role played by model state. And it turns out that there's a long, reflecting its critical role, there's a long history of, of, of articulating the, pro, the, the properties of a system in terms of its, its behavior um, using a construct known as a state space or phase space. And, and the idea here, it, it has a diagrammatic significance, but it has a conceptual significance beyond, beyond the diagrams of the figures. 
So um, it'll provide us this perspective on the system evolution that is state focused, where each um, element of the state is in a, a different axis. So we might have an axis for number of susceptibles and, and an SIR model or, or an SIT model where we have people temporarily immune and then recovering. S, I, and, and temporarily immune. And you'll notice there's no axis here for time. You know, most of our diagrams that we've built, of course, have, have time on the x-axis and some measured variable. Maybe it's a stock like the number of susceptibles or the number of infective on the y-axis. Or maybe it's a flow, right? The number of new infected infections or, or something. But but where you have time as an as an axis. And here we don't have that. Here we have each axis being a quantity from the model and typically a, a very commonly a stock if we're dealing with a model explicitly, um, otherwise a measured quantity if we're dealing with data from the world. This is susceptible, infective, and temporarily immune people. And at any time, the system's at a certain point in the state space. And as the system evolves over time, the values of the stocks, the values of, or the, the measured quantities change, right? The number of susceptible people may decline. So this is actually depicting the evolution of a system where basically everyone starts initially susceptible. That's why it's way out here. Then over time, there's fewer susceptibles and it's proceeding along and there's more infective. So it's kind of going along this x-axis. Effectives are building up, but there's not too many people temporarily immune yet. But over time, more people have become infected. There's fewer susceptibles. You, it's kind of a 3D, so it's hard to see. But but the number of temporarily immune people build up. And the system is evolving in terms of the number of infectives. And the number of infectives at some point reaches a maximum, starts declining. And it's heading towards an equilibrium in which the number of new infections equals the number of recoveries. Each infective infects one person, et cetera. So that's an example of a state space portrait. It's different from a time plot, but it depicts system behavior over time, not just for one variable, for, for all three of these variables, right? Which happen in this case to be the, the three stocks of this diagram. But you can build these diagrams and we do build these diagrams with gusto, with empirical data. Um, and so, an evolution of the model or an evolution of the system in the external world is associated with a trajectory in the state space. It evolves over time and etches out a trajectory where at any given time, it's at a certain value of susceptible, right? A certain number of people here, a certain number of infectives, right? A certain number of people here and a certain number of temporarily immune people, right? That determines its coordinate at a given time, right? There's a, at any one time, there's a certain number here, that's what's depicted here. And over time, it evolves, it changes, right? Susceptibles maybe go down. And so we're kind of going along here in a way that it's kind of coming out along, along this direction and infectives is building up, et cetera. And we can view it from different perspectives. And sometimes we see that what appears to be a 3D plot turns out actually it's, it's not really occupying all three dimensions. It's, it may look that way, but if we look at it from the right angle, it may be that it what it's that it that it's not occupying all that 3D space. It's really maybe it's 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 in 3D, just like you know this. Uh, this uh, stretched uh, surface isn't 3D, but intrinsically it's two-dimensional. It's just embedded in 3D, but everything is going on on a flat surface. Mm. Um, and that, we can do this with empirical data and it'll be whispering to us about some conservation properties. The fact that really there's only two degrees of freedom here. I mean, really, given there's a fixed total population, no one's dying, no one's coming in, all you really need to specify is if you know that total population, say it's 300,000 and you know 
the number of susceptibles, maybe it's 150,000, you know, the number of infectives, maybe it's 50,000, right? So between them, you get 200,000. That tells you the number of temporarily immune people. Mm -hmm. So 150,000 plus 50,000, total population of 300,000, you've got to, got to have 100,000 people here. So, so here, it may look like there's three numbers, but... It, but really, all we have to do is specify two and the information the other is fully given. And we can do this with data from the world and we see similar uh, similar patterns. Um, um, so for example, in the in the pandemic, we might plot out daily reported cases and daily reported deaths, for example, and see the uh, and where the the color here is based on uh, uh, recency, for example. So it went kind of down like this and it circled up like this and circled around. This is this is empirical data. Uh, or we see something like this with daily admissions and beds full. This is from uh, UK. Um, uh, or we can look at uh, the evolution of new cases in the past week and change in case rate for, for this week compared to the others. And you could see these these arcs, or here in, in data uh, with noisified from Saskatchewan in terms of the evolution of the system and successive waves of the of the the pandemic. Now these arcs that we see here are whispering to us about the state of the underlying system. They're, they're telling us something about its structure at the same time. And if we look at their dimensionality, whether they're 2D or 3D, it tells us essentially how much information we need to characterize the system well. Um, tells us something about its feedbacks and, and, and how it evolves. Now, when we're viewing things in state space, there's a particular important role for places where the flow is stationary. And, and if we were to think in terms of the equations governing evolution of the system that, that shape its evolution, these are places where the derivatives are zero, but the system is in balance. So I want to pose to you as a question for answering, say, in chat here, um, is there a place in this diagram that we see before us where you suspect the system is more or less in balance, where it's not changing anymore. And I, I'd remind you, it starts from here and it goes along this trajectory. Where, where would you say that the system might be close to balance here? Yeah, the center of the spiral. That's right, exactly. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's at this point, it's not going anywhere fast, right? It's it's more or less staying in the center. It's it's kind of arcing around there. It's oscillating around there, you know, progressively smaller oscillations, but it's going to some, what we call a fixed point. And this is an attractor. This is a basin of attraction. It's attracting it to this point. It's attracting it to this location where it will be in rests. And, you know, at a, we might think of it as getting closer and closer, but this is the attractor towards which it is headed. Okay, and those attractors come in, in different forms. Um, some of them are, it just goes kind of directly into them, sucks it in, it stays there. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a limit cycle and it cycles around it. You may remember that from last time. Pull up your any logics. We're going to use them soon and illustrate these facts with the very model that we built together in this class. So call up your any logics, get that model loaded. If you don't have it from last time, go get it from the course site version six. It's down at the bottom. And you'll see that these attractor or these fixed points, these points of stasis where the system is in balance, where it's, it's not changing form different cycles. And some of them, it doesn't even reach normally. It just cycles around it, cycles around it. It never fully realizes it. It, 
it just oscillates around it. Others it sucks in. There are others that are unstable, where if you start the system in this point, well, there's a maybe... there's a question in the okay. chat, Professor, that you might want to Thank address. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, no stupid questions here. Um, uh, so, uh, do -do -do. Uh, how do you know that certain the path isn't traced from the center of the spiral? Good question. Um, here we know each of these points is at a different point of, of time. We don't have an axis for time, but we generally will have either a point. If, if this is data from a model that's being plotted out, like, like from this model, we know what time was used, you know, at what time it reached each of these points. If it's data from the world, like here, um, we know on what date that data was received, um, you know, on what date the daily admissions and the beds full were at this point or this point or this point. So generally we have a pretty clear directionality. We know if it's flowing this way or we know if it's flowing this way. Um, uh, and, uh, and so time isn't shown as an axis but it's rather implicit here. I say implicit because there's nothing that is, it's not broken out as, as an axis, but generally we will we'll think of there being an arrow along here that says, hey, go here next, go in this direction. Um, hopefully that's uh, uh, that's helpful there. And um, uh, yeah, so, um, so generally that's that's not a problem, but you know, here it's not shown and, and that's just a diagrammatic um omission on my part. It's um we don't have to see it. We'll see where those arrows come in in just a minute. Um okay, so um here you know we can determine the the nature and geometry around a fixed point. Um uh and we can actually assess when we're dealing with a model by the stability around the, the fixed point. Now, I rec recognize that um, people here come from different levels of mathematical background and comfort. And I worked on our first day or two to ensure that, you know, for 394, we can ensure people are comfortable with a broad set of concepts. But for those interested, you know, you'll find lectures of me online where I talk about determining the, the stability of these, these equilibria. Um, and, and today's discussion will much be about equilibria in the state spaces. But you know, we've, we've been going in a kind of slide heavy fashion and I, I wanna illustrate this and it's quite easy to illustrate in a, in a basic form. So I'm gonna stop my slides and taking advantage of my exhortation to you to call up um, any logic, I'm, I'm going to go and we will, because it's not allowing me to save because I haven't changed anything, I'll, I'll just futz with it. Okay, fine. So you have version seven. I'm gonna save this as version seven. And I want you to go through this with me. So we're gonna create a state space portrait for this uh, model, but we're gonna do it with only a susceptible infective. So it'll be somewhat incomplete because we want to depict it in, in two dimensions. Now, for those who are visualization minded, perhaps your mind will be racing. We can do a lot better than simply two dimensions with a modicum of, of effort. I'm going to go to the analysis palette and I'm going to drag in a, a, a plot here. Okay. Um, with a modicum of effort, we could go beyond 2D. Maybe we use color for the third dimension. We kind of saw that earlier uh, uh, a little bit. Or or um, maybe we use a 3D visualization device. Uh, our TA Wade has done amazing work with the Oculus, for example, uh, for 3D visualization of, of things that turn out to be um, very closely related to to the, to the state space idea. Um, so uh, 
there's rich opportunities for visualization here, but let's do it in a most basic form. We'll create a kind of, you know, a, a state space. So I'm going to say state space plot. Uh, won't be depicting the state space uh, with with all of its detail. It'll be a projected projected down version of the state space. And we're going to put on each axis here what? What? In a state space portrait, or alternatively, we call it phase space, what's on each axis? What did I say was on each axis? If it's not time, what is it? Put it in the, in the chat. What is it if it's not? I said it's not time. That's for a state space portrait. What's on each axis? Yeah, the, the, here, most commonly the stocks. Yeah, it's, it's quantities from the model. So we're going to put for the x-axis, we will put susceptible, a quantity of some significance. And for the y-axis, we'll put infective, okay? Infect, infective, boom. Those are the two values of the stock, okay? Susceptible and infective. And we'll call this uh, susceptible horizontal and, and infective vertical. Vertical. Mm. Now, we'll also futz with this a little bit just to make sure that it's updated. Uh, maybe we'll do this one every point one as well. Um, no, 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 because we extended the axis. So just every one day, so we'll update. And we'll record the latest 7,300 samples because we extended for 20 years. And um, and there's a, uh, yeah, there's, there's I think, um, not sure we need to specify. Wade, maybe you could tell me, or Wade or Jenna, I don't think we have to specify any other quantity here. So um, to, to get it to display all those points. Correct me if I'm wrong, TAs. Okay, so I just built this. What did I do? I, I added, look, I added a plot from the palette, right? I added this plot. Uh, it's not a time plot. It's a it's another type of plot. It's a state space plot in this case. And we we said, you know, we're going to plot susceptible along one axis and effective along another. So you folks are familiar with this model. We've spent much time together. Uh, working with this model, you've had considerable opportunities to enjoy the pleasure of its acquaintance. So you know what its basic behavior is for the baseline. I want you to tell me, reflecting on its baseline behavior, how it changes initially, what do we expect to see in terms of the state space? If we've got susceptible going along here and infective along here, what what do we expect to see? What where will it start and how will it evolve visually within this plot? Could people put forward suggestions in the chat? Where will it start? You know, you remember, you'll surely remember the starting point of this model, right? Start at the bottom right. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, Teague has it precisely, um, and uh, and start with population uh, basically entirely susceptible, and basically almost no infectives, right? So it'll start like way down here. Now, by the way, it won't be one here; it'll be like three hundred thousand or something. But it will basically be down the lower right. We have virtually no infectives and we have susceptibles and then which way which direction will it go will it go straight up well it's somehow loop around here to the right which or which way to the left okay and and why to the left why to the left and up tusif is exactly right why to the left and up why would it go to the left if this is susceptible uh okay spiral counterclockwise quite right patrick because susceptibles decrease and infectives increase, darn right. Um, 
and Hamid says, uh, let's susceptible more infective as they get infected because susceptible death right. Because population susceptible decreases, population infective increases. Okay, so it's going to be going up here. And Sophia is normal, is thinking ahead. So it's going to be going up here. But is it going to go up this way arbitrarily long? Is it going to go up and go up and go up and off my screen up here? Off the screen to the left and and, and up at the top? What, what is it going to be doing? It can't go above the initial population of susceptibles. It's exactly right. Or it can't go above the total population of the model infectives. And it should go down at some point. Okay, so what's going to happen? How does it bend over time? How does it naturally bend? As effectives decrease, okay, so so the, the comments are coming thick and fast, and I welcome. As the comments, as infectives decrease due to vac. okay, well, suppose we have no vaccination. I asked for the baseline case, no vaccination. I, I welcome that thought, but no vaccination. Okay, they'll stay in positive, so they're going to be in the positive quadrant, so they won't go negative. Good, but but how does it how does it move here to the upper left? Okay, so at some point, infective infected will decrease, and, and susceptibles increase again. No. Uh, okay, so this is going to be some point, but what will it do immediately? So it's rising, 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 and. In infectives decrease against susceptibles, and then what? Okay, it spirals. It spirals. Yes, um, I think uh, Tusif may have said it earlier, or Teague. Um, and it's going to be some curve. And yes, there's a curve that satisfies susceptible plus infective is less than or equal to uh, is is less than or equal to 300k. That's darn right. People have to be in this susceptible infective or. Um, Recovery. So you're starting to see some effects of conservation, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's good to think these things through up front to sort of challenge your expectations and, and help you sharpen your thinking as you learn from the model, as you see model results. So let's run it, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. Okay. And let's let's go up here, cumulative infections. Um So this is the baseline. Good. Notice I'm just doing susceptible infective. This is cumulative infective infections. This is the states, this is the time portrait. But what we see is broadly consistent with uh, what Sophia, um, and Sophia, I think, identified as spiraling counterclockwise. Uh, first and and so on. It 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 rises here as we get more and more infectives and uh, and fewer susceptibles. Why does it go down here like this? What what's what's going on here? Someone give me a narrative in the in the chat. Um. Uh, yes. No. No one will be initially in the recovery chart. Darn, darn right. People start recovering and and remember this is infective. So so. The effectives are drained as people are recovering, right? And yes, as inflow is less than outflow because there's fewer new people getting infected because there's fewer effectives to infect them and there's fewer susceptibles. Um, but okay, now we start to rebuild susceptibles, right? Um, why are we rebuilding susceptibles? Why is susceptibles going up here? Why is susceptibles rising? Why, why are we going to the right here again? Waning of immunity, darn right. Yeah. You have more pe people coming into the susceptible stock faster than they're being drained by infection. Okay. And where is it resting? Where is it? Where's its point where it's not changing anymore here? Essentially stopped. Where is that? Yeah, it's it's basically where it's ending here, right? This is the point of balance, right? Where, where the rate of change of susceptibles is zero, rate of change of infectives is zero, rate of change of recovered, for that matter, is, is zero. After all, if you know susceptibles and infectives, uh, well, if if it were just two, th those three stocks in a circulated population, we didn't have been uh, vaccinated. Here we, we designed it so we have no vaccination in this scenario. We Basically, if we know susceptible infective, we know the recovered from the 
from the initial population. That's good. Um, now, we could examine the effects of some of uh, those other scenarios, couldn't we? Um, uh, and you remember that this is the model we actually elaborated, right, with effects of, of, of treatment time. Um, we could say, suppose we had, instead of the 30 that are there for the baseline, suppose that we had, I'm sorry, 50 that were there for the baseline. Suppose we had only one initial healthcare worker, one public health nurse working or one clinical nurse working to, to treat in the STI clinic. How do you expect this to change? What do we expect if we go up and peek at that graph? What do we expect to see, ladies and gentlemen? What do, what do we expect to see? Surely someone could come forward with a thought. What, what do we expect to see? How will it differ from what we've just seen if we have only one initial healthcare worker? Will that lead to recovery times that are longer or shorter? That, those will lead to recovery times that are longer or shorter. That's a question. Yeah, longer for people to recover. Good, good, good. And Mark says it will go up to a much higher equilibrium level. And there we see it. Equilibrium is way up here. Give me a narrative. What's going on here in this population? What's going on? The changed assumption about the amount of healthcare resources involved. Yeah, basically almost everyone is sick, right? Virtually no people are susceptible. As soon as people get susceptible again, boom. The hazard rate is very high. The force of infection is very high. They get infected in, I don't know, less than a week or something. They were just recovered from chlamydia and then they get infected again. Just recover from gonorrhea and they get infected again. Bummer. Yeah, it's it's not a good thing. Um, if we have 200 initial healthcare workers, how would you expect to see things? How, would, how might that affect things in the state space portrait? If we have not 50, but 200, how, how do we expect it, it to change things? Anyone? Quick recovery. And, and what will that lead to, do you think, in, in terms of the state space portraits? Yeah, OK. So, so this is what we see. What was the big difference between the last one, when we were one healthcare worker, and this one? Anyone? Lower equilibrium. Yeah, lower in terms of infectives, right? More susceptibles. Remember that one was like way up, up here, almost no susceptibles at any given time and lots of infectives here. We have low number of infectives at equilibrium, more susceptibles, right? What's this kind of loop thing? Where You you tell me, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna stop this and I'm, I'm gonna start running it and we'll see the parallel evolution here on this. Um, so so this is going and we can also see what it corresponds to and on on these graphs, okay. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit uh, uh, the oscillation. Yes, yes, that's exactly right, Sophia. This is the oscillation in susceptibles, right? And in infectives, right? Um, and so if we went and we looked at it here, you can kind of see it jiggling around for recovered, right? You can see it jiggling around for susceptible, right? Jiggling around for infective, right? And if we went and we looked at this, I don't know if it will show a sufficiently broad thing, but you can kind of see it go up and, down and kind of jiggling around and wiggling and wriggling, you know, but basically it approaches uh, this kind of uh, equilibrium, right? where the system's in balance in terms of the number of susceptible is not changing over time. The number of infective is not changing over time. The number of recovered is not changing over time. There's a waiting list and it's just long enough that the waiting time is such that the number of people recovering is, is equal to the number of people getting affected. The number of people getting who are recovering is the same as the number of waning immunity. Okay, so that's good. Now let's run, um, a situation where we have some vaccination going on, right? Um, 
Uh, so suppose we add three quarters uh, initially. Well, let's say 90 percent vaccinated. How do you think that will affect things? How, how would it look differently in terms of that state space portrait? Anyone? How will it be different here? Mm -hmm. This is 90% infected. What, what's going on here? This is a state-based portrait. What's going on? If it were the same axis, the same, it would look like it barely moves. That's right. Um, eventually, less people stay infected. Yeah, so what, what happened here with 90% of the population being infected? What happened? What's going, remember, susceptible, infected. What's going on in terms of the number of infectives? Does it grow like gangbusters? The infection didn't get a chance to spread as much. Yeah. Never got over one person infected at a given time. So what's happening? Well, that person who was initially infected, well, it was one person at the start, right? It was infected. And then the number who were infected goes down and it, Initially, they're recovered, so it hasn't increased yet the number of susceptibles, but then it loops around and we get more and more susceptibles and it goes to the state where we have a larger number of susceptibles. Okay, now let's look at the case where maybe three quarters of the population are, are, in, are vaccinated. Tell me, in, the, in this model, if we vaccinate three quarters of the uh, population, remind me, does that drive the infection extinct? Can you tell me? Does it drive it extinct? No, no, it doesn't. Because it's not enough to lower the basic reproductive number to one. Remember the basic reproductive number for this model is, again, 20 times 0.1, that's two, times the, the mean time until present for treatment, which is six. And you need no more than one sixth of your population susceptible, right? Um, yeah, I see some great discussion taking place in the uh, 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 the x-axis number of infectives. But um, but remember, it's it's uh, these are measured in, as continuous uh, quantities. And so you could think of if you say 0.1 person, what does that really mean? Well, you could think of it as kind of a probability that they remain infected. Hey, what's going on here? Anyone? What's going on here? Like a stable oscillation. Remember this one? Remember this one? We saw it in the final minutes of class. This is what's called the limit cycle, folks. It's a limit cycle around an, an equilibrium. We, we sometimes refer to these as dynamic equilibria. They're, they're not really equilibria where nothing is changing, but they are this kind of repeated periodic behavior that is, is in a sense a resting pattern around a certain point. But I would argue, there is an equilibrium around this point. Where, this, it's whispering of an equilibrium. Where is that equilibrium? If we had to pick out where the equilibrium is, it may not reach it, but where is it? Anyone want to surmise a guess? Where is an equilibrium here? Where is the equilibrium located? It's not reaching it, but where, where would it be? If we could suddenly transport the system to an equilibrium, where do you think it would be? The center of the spiral is exactly right. It yearns to get there, but it it never can make it. It never gets to this kind of point of rest. There's this kind of oscillatory behavior in terms of how long it takes to recover. And you know, once it's looking good and you've reduced the number of 
new infections enough, guess what happens? What 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 kind of dooms it once you've reduced the number of new infections enough? What happens to foil it from getting to that point where the the number of of of, of susceptibles you know recovers um, to a sufficiently high level? What what goes on? Yeah, it looks like an airfoil is right, but what what reduces it? Prevents it from reaching this equilibrium? Well, yeah, I mean, look if if you reduce the number of infectives here um you know you or or here you reduce the number of new people getting infected and that builds up the number of susceptibles right which sets the stage for a new outbreak and it and it circles around this is a limit cycle ladies and gentlemen yeah exactly fraction s over n is larger and it creates more contacts and therefore more infectives State-space portraits give an understanding here that's very rich. And we can create them for empirical data, and we see patterns like this, right? This is what I was showing you. These are patterns from the world that we're plotting out on, on data from measured cases or admis hospital admissions, a, a, a tweaks of data from our fair province, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it is whispering to us about an underlying system whose structure gives rise to this. And although I don't have time to discuss it here, I will tell you that for a very broad class of these systems, a broad class of possible ways of measuring it, these portraits, these state space plots created with empirical data like this one or this one, or or this one, or this one. The patterns that they arc out in this sort of space are just stretched, squeezed versions of the state space of the underlying system. And in fact, you can do it with a single measurement if you plot it out over time. The current value and the value previous time or three axes to value two times ago. And we may talk about that at the end of the class. How, how a single measurement in a coupled system, a system where you have coupling among all its, all its stocks, a single measurement from the, say, infective stock, if you plot it out, its current value, its value a week or a day ago and two days ago, that contains information about what's going on in terms of the recovery, it's in terms of the susceptibles. It it contain it's whispering to you about information if you know how to listen to it about the rest of the system. In the sense, in a math sense, using the language of differential geometry, it's it's diffeomorphic too. It's it's a stretch version of, of the state space, of the actual underlying system. Even if we don't have a model in mind, empirical data whispers to us about that state space. Sometimes it positively yells about aspects of that state space. It tells us how many variables we definitely need to characterize it. For example. So these gives us hints for what, what our modeling needs are. And I don't have time to talk about this more now, but it's an important link between data science and system science. In our case, wouldn't we need 3D? Indeed, indeed. Um, unfortunately, uh, we can't buy everyone in the class an Oculus to view this, and any logic support for that is very limited. So um, here we've, we've just done a projection of state space, Mark. But in this case, if we have, if we were to have no vaccination going on, um, uh, then the recovered number would be linearly dependent on the other two, right? It's the total population minus the sum of the number recovered at any one time is going to be without vaccination will be the total population size minus the sum of S and I, right? Um, sum of, of S plus I, uh, in other words, uh, S plus total population minus S minus I, if you want to remove the parents. And, um, 
And so there it would be linearly dependent. But you're, Mark, you're thinking about exactly uh, fruitfully. Yeah. Um, uh, and in general, we'll need more than than three dimensions, and we can use dimensions uh, more than uh, three dimensions, or use more than excuse me, more than two dimensions. And we'll, we'll use we can use start using more than two dimensions with tools like uh, virtual reality or or, or like um, uh, by uh, clever coloring um, and other other tools, state space portraits. But I want to cover something more than that, if I may. So I'm going to uh, stop this recording for a moment.